please, we're going to, yeah, give him that. That'd be good. Uh, let's turn to Judges. Judges chapter number eight, please. Judges chapter number eight. And uh, good to see you here for Sunday school. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to uh, William following the Lord and believers' baptism next week. And then uh, the baptistry will be open also the 25th, looking for other folks who I know have been saved to follow the Lord in baptism. And uh, let's pray for uh, those new believers that they will take that step uh, for the Lord. Judges chapter 8, the last two weeks uh, we've been looking at the life, the story of Gideon. Remember in the book of Judges, there, there's a cycle that repeats over and over and again where God's people would get away from the Lord, they disobey the Lord, and so the Lord would allow a foreign nation to come in and rule over them. And at some point, uh, they would repent. God's people would repent. They would turn back to the Lord. They would uh, look to the Lord for help, and the Lord would raise up a judge, a judge who would come and deliver them. Uh, but the Lord would use the judge to deliver them uh, from their enemies. And so in this case with Gideon, uh, the enemy is Midian. And uh, Gideon, as you re may remember, Judges chapter 6, uh, Gideon was threshing wheat at the wine press. He was trying to hide the wheat from the Midianites so that he could sustain his family, so that he could have something for his family to eat. And uh, the Lord came to him and he said, I'm going to use you. In so many words, he said, I'm going to use you to deliver Israel out of the hand of Midian. And uh, I like what Gideon asked, uh, verse uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 13, Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles? Gideon was looking for some miracles. Gideon was looking for God to work in his life and in the life of his family. And uh, he said, uh, where are all those miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us. The Lord had not forsaken them, uh, but they were uh, being chastised because of their sin. They were being chastised because they were serving other idols. They were uh, walking away from the Lord. And uh, the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And verse 15, he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. He said, my family's poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least, I'm the poorest in my family. How in the world am I going to save Israel? Well, because the, the uh, saving of Israel, the victory did not depend on Gideon's strength, Gideon's resources, Gideon's wisdom. It depended upon the Lord's wisdom and the Lord's strength. And uh, the key, verse 16, the Lord said unto him, surely I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And of course, we've seen uh, several places in Judges 6 and 7 where Gideon still had fears. And uh, just a reminder that being a person of courage does not mean you don't have fear. Being a person of courage does not mean uh, sometimes you, you, you don't hesitate. No, Gideon did hesitate. He had many times he'd step back and say, Lord, are you sure? And the Lord would, would reassure him again. And we need that from time to time. We need the Lord to reassure us, to encourage us. Uh, we are just flesh. And Gideon needed that. And God gave him that encouragement many, many a time. And so we saw in Judges 6 where Gideon not only built an altar to the Lord, but he tore down the altar that was built unto Baal. So it's not enough sometimes just to make a new right decision it's also important to undo some old wrong decisions, to tear down some things in your life so that you can build the right things. Remember Jeremiah's ministry. Out of the six things the Lord told Jeremiah to do, four of them you could say were negative. He told Jeremiah, you're to tear down, you're to destroy, you're to pluck up. Why? So he could plant and build the right things. Uh, think of a garden. If you want to plant the right things, you have to tear out the wrong things. Uh, if you want to build a structurally sound building, you have to tear down the old one. And that's why the Bible, uh, that's why the Lord told Gideon, he said, go tear down that altar to Baal. He said, but if you're afraid to do it, take some people with you. Well, he was afraid. And he took some servants, 10 servants, and he did it by night. And uh, in the morning they woke up and, and the people said, hey, who tore down our altar? Who tore down the grove unto Baal? And they said, whoever did it, let's kill him. They said, what well, was Gideon? And they said, well, let's kill Gideon then. Well, Gideon's dad now. Convicted, he said, listen, he said, if Baal is a real God, verse 32, chapter 6, let Baal plead against him because he had thrown down his altar. So Gideon got a new name, Jerob Baal, meaning let Baal plead. 
Well, then we saw last week in Judges chapter 7 how that uh, Gideon uh, had a very small army compared to the host of the enemy, compared to the Midianites. He had 32,000 men. And that's compared to at least 135,000 Midianites, at least. And so that his, he was very much outnumbered. But notice what the Lord said to Gideon, Judges chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are, what's the, what does it say in verse 2, chapter 7? The people that are with thee are what? Too many. Why? Notice, see, they're too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. He said, he said, You have too many soldiers, you have too many men, because if I deliver the Midianites into your hand right now, you're going to brag, brag, you're going to say, We did it, it was our wisdom, it was our plan that got it done. The Lord said, I'm not going to allow that. I'm not going to share my glory with anybody, so you're going to follow my plan. You're going to humble yourself, follow my plan, and I'm going to get all the credit and all the glory but it will be for your good. And so he gave Gideon the plan. He said, go announce and say, if you're scared, go home. Well, that's exactly what he did. And when he said, uh, verse 3, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And the return of the people, 20 and 2,000. So 22,000 men left, admitting they were scared. Now there's still 10,000 left, but it's not because they aren't scared. Gideon himself is still scared but they don't want to admit they're scared. So there's still 10,000 left, 22,000 have gone home. The Lord said unto Gideon, verse 4, the people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there, and it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And who, of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. So he said, everybody who gets down on their hands and knees, gets down into the water, set them to one side. Everybody who is alert, focused, they just take their hand and they bring the water to their mouth. They just lap the water out of their mouth, set them to one side. Well, there were 300 men, the Bible says in verse 6, who put their hand to their mouth. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man unto his place. So those 300 men that are left, they also have to be men of faith. They also have to be men of courage to face such an amazing army with only 300 men. And then it's going to get a little more difficult. God's going to test their faith again. Has God ever done that to you? Has God ever tested your faith once and you said, well, I, I got through that one. And then he says, well, I'm not done. He tests your faith again. All right, well, I got through that one. And he tests your faith again. Well, that's what he's doing with Gideon and with the men who are with Gideon. And notice when he comes to the men, I, I, again, place yourself, put yourself in one of those 300 men's sandals for a minute, okay? You know, there's not a sword, there's not a spear, there, there isn't something that, uh, some amazing weapon that he, Gideon hands to you that you're going to use to destroy the Midianites. What does he hand you? He hands you a pitcher. What, what are we going to do with this, Gideon? You know, make lemonade? Have, what's the pitcher for? He hands you a trumpet. Well, what are we going to do with a trumpet? He hands you a torch. That's it, those three things. So he handed them lamps, he hands them pitchers, and he hands them trumpets. Verse 17, And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him, verse 19, came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers. Do you realize that? That was a matter of obedience. That was a matter of faith. You know how much you believe God by how much you're willing to obey Him. Uh, here, there wasn't, there wasn't, well, Gideon, I think we could maybe come up with a better plan. It was, here's God's plan. I'm going to give you a lamp. I'm going to give you a pitcher. I'm going to give you a trumpet. Do what I do. 
and they just simply obeyed. I want to remind us that we don't always understand God's ways. We don't always understand. Many times we don't understand God's ways. We don't understand God's methods. Uh, and that's where wisdom come in, comes in. Wisdom is saying, I may not understand how this is going to work out, but I know what God's word has said. That's knowledge. And wisdom is, I'm going to obey the Lord whether I understand it or not. Well, here the men obey the Lord and notice what happens. Verse 20, the three companies blew the trumpets, break the pitchers, and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And so now the host of the Midianites, they're fighting each other. They're killing each other. And uh, verse 23, the men of Israel gathered themselves together. So all those men that went home because they were scared or they were sent home because they were putting their faces down in the water, they come back out to help fight the battle. Uh, notice verse 24, Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim. So now he's sending messengers to another place saying, hey, come join us, help us in this battle. So it wasn't just Gideon's 300 now at this point. Now others have joined in the fight again. Notice Gideon, verse 24, sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Bera and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bera and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side side Jordan. And now we'll pick up where we left off last week, Judges chapter 8. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, unto Gideon, why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. Uh, let's pray. Lord, I do ask you even now that you'll speak to our hearts. Lord, you know the needs that are in, in our hearts this morning. Please teach us from your word, Lord, apply your word to us today. Give us what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. This should be a time of rejoicing. This should be a time of excitement. The children of Israel have been under the thumb of the Midianites for years now, and God has used Gideon to begin to bring deliverance, and he's going to give total deliverance through Gideon. But right in the middle of the battle, I mean right in the middle of when they ought to be focused on fighting the enemy, here comes someone from their own ranks, the men of Ephraim. And instead of being happy that Orb and Zeb are dead, instead of being happy that the Midianites are killing each other and destroying themselves, instead of being happy that God's people are being victorious, they begin to get critical and angry with Gideon. Have you ever had that happen in your own life? Somebody who ought to be supporting you, somebody who ought to be encouraging you, Somebody who ought to be backing you up and saying, hey, let's go. Let's win another soul. Hey, that's wonderful what the Lord's done. Have you ever had it where instead they throw a wet blanket on you or they criticize you or they attack you? And you don't see it coming. I mean, it blindsides you. You expect that from the world. You expect that from the devil. You expect that from the flesh. But you don't expect that from your brothers in arms. You don't expect that from people who are on your side. But it happens sometimes. And there's a big key that we must learn that we can learn from this chapter that when that happens or when uh, something of that nature happens, we are attacked and we're doing what we ought to do. We're, we're doing, we're focused on the right thing, but somebody who ought to be encouraging us attacks us, criticizes us. What should we do? Well, I want you to see, number one, our cause is bigger than we are. And I want you to think through what are, what are your causes that you're fighting for in life? What are, what are some of the causes you're fighting for? Number one, how about married couples, your marriage? That's an important cause to fight for. Now, I don't mean to fight with each other, though I know that happens sometimes, but, uh, but that's a cause to fight for. People give up too soon on their marriages. They do. They give up, you know, she burned the toast and he threw his socks on the floor and that's it. You know, we're done. We, ought to, we need to try a little bit harder. We need to try a little bit harder. Your marriage is a cause worth fighting for. Rearing your children, that's a cause worth fighting for. 
uh, the Great Commission, winning souls to Christ. I mean, we're in a battle for souls. If, if we don't bring them to Christ, if we don't give them the gospel, they go to hell. This is a serious cause. I mean, there's a cause. And, and you can fill in the blank with whatever other cause that you know is God-given in your own life. And I want to say this, number one, again, your cause, my cause, is bigger than I am. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is it's bigger than my feelings. It's bigger than my reputation. It's bigger than my honor. It's bigger than my importance. You know, I, you've heard this, uh, anyone who follows sports at all, and be careful how much you follow sports. Don't, don't make them a, an idol and, and uh, don't lift them up to your kids as if they're great role models. Most of them are not. Uh, but that being said, uh, athletics can be good. It can teach you discipline and character. And, and uh, there's a statement that you may have heard, and uh, it's, I've heard it many a time regarding teams. And here's what they'll say to players. Coaches will sometimes say this to a player. They'll say, listen to me, the name on the front of your jersey is more important than the name on the back of your jersey. Now, what do they mean by that? What they mean is the organization, the team, is more important than you as the individual. In our own lives, think through this. The causes you're fighting for, your marriage, rearing your children, the Great Commission, that cause is more important. It's bigger than the individual units that make up the cause. Uh, and I want you to see what Gideon did when these men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus? Now, now put yourself in Gideon's shoes for a minute. How could you have responded? I mean, you're the one who stepped out by faith. You're the one who called a bunch of people and only 300 were with you at the end and God's giving you victory. What could Gideon have said? He could have said, I don't want to hear it. Don't talk to me. God's using me to bring great victory. Hey, you, and by the way, the Ephraimites are pretty ornery many times through scripture. You can, you can read that. He could have just gone on the attack against them. You Ephraimites, you know, you're always criticizing. Man, you might as well, with friends like these, uh, who needs enemies? He could have said something like that. But instead, what did Gideon do? I want you to see what he did. Verse 1 says, they did chide with him sharply. I mean, they're getting in his face. They're arguing. That's heated. It's vehement. Verse 2, and he said unto them, what have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? What is he saying? He's saying, you men of Ephraim, the least thing that you've done out here is better than the best thing that I and my family have done. That takes humility to say something like that, doesn't it? He just said to him, the, the, the least important thing you did, it's better than the best thing that I and my family have done. Verse 3, he continues, God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. You know what Gideon is doing? He is operating in wisdom. You know what he had to do? He had to humble himself for the sake of his cause. See, yeah, but I'm right. Let's think of your marriage for a minute, or my marriage for a minute, okay? I'm right. Is there a cause bigger than you being right right now? Is there a cause bigger than that? Uh, yeah, but brother so-and-so at church didn't shake my hand. They probably didn't right now, you know, especially right now. They didn't, they didn't talk to me. They weren't kind to me the way I think they should have been. They said something a little cross. Well, let me ask you, have you ever said something you regret to somebody else? Have you ever said, man, I wish I'd said that differently? Is the cause, what we're doing here, reaching souls for Christ, is that more important than my feelings? You can answer that. Is it more important than my feelings? It is. Is it more important than your feelings? You can answer that one too. Yes, it is. Uh, is it more important than my honor, my pride, my name? It is. The cause is more important. And this is where Gideon humbled himself. What we must remember, we must never forget this. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. Well, in this case, where is the pride found? It's not in Gideon, it's in Ephraim. There is pride in the hearts of the men of Ephraim. So what did it take to diffuse that pride? It took humility. It took Gideon's humility to say, you know what? 
the least that the Abayis writes, me and my family, we've done. I mean, the best that we've done is less than the least of what you've done. He humbled himself. And don't ever forget this. God resisteth the proud. What's the last part of that verse? But giveth what? Grace unto the humble. How many of you want God's grace? I know we have it with salvation. But I want God's favor on my life. I want God to give me favor I don't deserve for every part of my life. I want blessing. So you know what that means? It means I'm better off humbling myself and letting God take care of my back. You know, it, I think of David when Sheba, the son of Bichri, cursed him as David was leaving Jerusalem. You know what David said? He said, let him curse. He said, if God bid him curse, let him curse. You know what David was saying? God, I'm in your hands and it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about the cause. And I'm part of something far bigger than myself as an individual. I, I want to look at a few things. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. And we could, we could spend the rest of the time just looking at this topic. But I want to move forward. But look at Proverbs 16. Because this is so important that we understand this. Uh, pride is part of our human nature. It's what... Uh, led Satan to fall, get kicked out of heaven. And it's something we battle every day. And it doesn't come in the same form that you know, we imagine. We, we may imagine pride as you know, somebody walks around with a snooty look and they're better than everybody. Well, that, that could be a manifestation of pride. But, but, but pride comes in many forms. And by the way, it's hardest to recognize in yourself. It's hardest to recognize in yourself. It's easy to find it in somebody else or to think you found it in somebody else. So it's so important, though, that we deal with pride because we don't want God resisting us. We want God giving us grace. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 5. It says, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Look at verse 19 of this same chapter. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. It's better. It's better to be of a humble spirit with a lowly. Uh, I, I've told you my dad's vernacular. He used to say it this way. He'd say, it's better for you, Tim, to be getting run over by other people than to be running other people over. That's the way he would say it. What did he mean? He meant it's better for you to humble yourself. You know, if, if there's going to be contention, if there's going to be pride, don't let it be in your heart. You humble yourself. Humble yourself. Um, look at Proverbs 21. Verse number four, Proverbs 21, verse four. It says, an high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. If a parent and a child have a conflict, the parent is the authority. There's some pride in the child. The child needs to humble. Does this mean that there's never a time to call out pride? No, if, if you're a parent, your children are rising up in pride, you need to deal with that. But make sure that in your own heart, it's not pride. It's that you're not dealing in angry pride. Uh, it says, an high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Look at Proverbs 28, verse 5. Again, we could literally spend the rest of this hour just looking at uh, the rest of these next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, looking at this subject. It's everywhere in the Bible. Proverbs 28, and uh, look at verse... Uh, uh, that doesn't look right, but I'll read it anyway. It's a good verse. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. I'm not sure why I put that one there. I think I was looking for a different verse. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, pride is what is destructive to us. Uh, the Bible says that pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Our cause is bigger than we are. Our feelings, our reputation, our honor, our importance needs to come last. It really does. We need to put our cause first. We need to put the Lord first. Put others first. I want you to go back, please, to Judges 8. And when Gideon said that to the men of Ephraim, who again, uh, we'll see later in Judges and in other places in the Bible, you can see they were fairly angry people. They uh, caused a lot of problems in different places. But he humbled himself. Why? For the sake of his cause. I want you to see number two that our cause is bigger than our strength. Whatever it is you're fighting for, it's bigger than your strength, your ability. Uh, look at verse 4. Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and the 300 men that were with him, I love this part, faint yet pursuing them. Worn out, worn out, tired, 
but still pursuing. Uh, weary, but still pursuing. Where did he get that strength from the Lord? Verse 5, And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint. And I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thine army? And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And he went up thence to Penuel and spake unto them likewise. He asked them for food. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered him. And he spake also unto the men of Penuel, saying, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. He is so, so working so hard, fighting so hard. His men are faint, but they're still pursuing. Uh, I want you to go, please, get Galatians chapter 6. And uh, these are familiar verses. And they are true in the negative sense, but they're also true in the positive sense. Notice Galatians 6, 7. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whatever seed you plant, that's what you're going to reap. And by the way, you always reap after you sow. You always reap more than you sow. And, uh, and, and you always reap what you sow. Uh, notice verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now notice verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Whatever cause it is you're fighting for, don't get tired. Don't get weary of sowing the right seed for the harvest that you want later. Say, but I'm not seeing the results I want right now, whatever area it is. I'm not seeing the results I want right now. Listen, you're sowing a seed right now for a harvest you're going to have later. So don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary in obeying the Lord. Keep planting the right seed for the harvest you want to have in the future. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, please. Look at verse 1. Again, our cause is bigger than we are. It's bigger than our feelings, our reputation, our honor, our importance. But our cause is also bigger than our strength. It's bigger than our ability to handle it. And this is why Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Going through whatever I go through, through Christ, strengthens me. It makes me stronger. Uh, notice 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Uh, Paul writes, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. He said, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. And, and he enumerates his sufferings in this chapter. Uh, look at verse uh, 12. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. He said, this is a painful thing that we're going through, but it's bringing forth life in other people. Verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Your outward man may be getting weaker and weaker and weaker, but your inward man can get stronger every day through the Word of God, through prayer, through walking in the Spirit of God. Notice next. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So number one, our cause is bigger than we are. Number two, our cause, whatever it is that God has put into your life that you're fighting for, it's bigger than your ability and your strength. So you better depend on the Lord for His strength. You better lean on Him. You better be in His Word and on your knees so you can get through that battle and be faint yet pursuing, just like Gideon and his men. Go back to Judges 8. Number three, I want you to see that our cause is bigger than our critics and our enemies. We won't read this entire portion, verses 10 through 21, but you'll find that Gideon and his men, they still have an enemy and they still have critics. People that should have been supporting them weren't supporting them, and then they had enemies as well. And whatever cause you have from the Lord, you will have enemies, but you'll also have people who ought to be encouraging you, who will discourage you, who will throw a wet blanket on your fire, who will try to, try to tone you down when they ought to be encouraging you to be more for the Lord. And so, But we need to understand 
that our cause is bigger than our critics and our enemies. If you, if you stop moving forward every time somebody criticizes you, you'll never do anything for Christ. You'll never accomplish anything in life if you only move forward when everybody approves. Folks, it's so important to understand when you know what God's will is for your life, do it, no matter what the critics say. Do it. Uh, I, I love the story. You've heard me tell it, I don't know, four or five times. I hope I tell it right this time. I wasn't planning to, but this, this illustrates this perfectly. There was a, a man and a, and a boy. They were uh, walking with a, a mule to town. And uh, the old man was there, and he, he was leading the mule, and the boy was on the mule. And a couple people on the side of the road, they said, look, isn't that horrible? There's that, uh, there's that old man having to walk. And that young boy with fresh legs, he could be walking. Instead, he's making that man walk. And they overheard the people, and so the boy got off the mule, and the man got on the mule. They walked a little bit further. There were some other people there, and they said, look at that. Isn't that horrible? There's that old grown man riding that mule, making that young boy lead that mule. Isn't that terrible? And so they both got off the, he got off the mule again, and uh, this time they said, well, let's both ride the mule. So they both got on the mule. They rode a little further down the way, and some people on the side of the road said, look at that, isn't that terrible? Those two people breaking that mule's back. That poor mule, he can't handle it. So they went a little further down the road, and the boy and the man were both carrying the mule. That's how it worked. You know, the thing, the, the, the moral of the story is this. If you have to change every time somebody criticizes you, every time somebody, you know, doesn't like something a certain way, you're going you're gonna to drive yourself crazy. It doesn't matter if it's in the ministry for the Lord. doesn't matter if it's in your marriage, rearing your children. What I'm saying is this. Your cause is bigger than your critics. Your cause is bigger than your enemies. You stay focused on the Word of God. You stay focused on what you know to be God's will for your life and realize you're going to have battles every day. Ephesians 6 teaches us that and it tells us we need to be ready for war. We need to have on the whole armor of God every day. You need to expect discouragement, expect battles, expect war, even from those who ought to be encouraging you. You know, I've told you before, I've learned this. I've just learned it at church. I know when we have a big day, somebody gets saved, there's something exciting. I can promise you, I'm going to have one, two, or three battles, some form or another, that day, the next day, that week. It's just how it is. When you're, when you're going to do something for the Lord, you're going to have critics. You're going to have enemies. Expect the battle. And by the way, I've mentioned this before. I had a couple tell me once. They said, they said, Pastor, we know how something's God's will. We know it's something's God's will when it's just really easy. There's just no trouble. Well, that's not biblical. Biblically, if you're going the right way, you're going to have enemies. You're going to have friction. You're going to have persecution. You're going to have critics. So realize, though, that your cause is bigger than your critics and your enemies. We'll pick up next week. Uh, Judges chapter 8, we'll finish this story. But number one, just remember, your cause is bigger than you are. There are things in your life more important than your own personal reputation, your own personal importance, your own personal honor. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Uh, your cause is bigger than your strength. If you're going to be sufficient, you need the Lord's help. You need His strength. And then your cause is bigger than your critics and your enemies. You're going to have critics and enemies. It's not a sign you're doing the wrong thing. In fact, many times it's a sign you're going the right way. Uh, just yield to the Lord. Seek His will. Fight for your cause. Lord, we do pray that you'll apply your word to our hearts. Lord, you know the causes in our lives that are God-given causes, causes you've given us that you want us to fight for. Lord, help us to see the importance of our cause. Help us to be willing to humble ourselves for the sake of our cause. Lord, help us to be willing to die to self. Help us to be willing, Lord, to lean on you. We know we're not capable and strong enough in and of our own selves for our cause. And then, Lord, help us not to be distracted or discouraged by critics and enemies. When we know something's your will, help us to press forward and do what's right. We love you, Lord. Bless in the next hour, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.